in the fact that even the delivering of justice on many occasions requires such processes. In the normal course of things, any such inquiry process and the disciplinary proceedings flowing from that inquiry process are not subject to any kind of collective examination and interrogation. That is not only a fact, but perhaps that's also the way things should be. That no such process should normally take place under conditions where there is some kind of collective scrutiny of, at every stage of what, what is going on. If this case has turned out to be different, then there should and must have been extremely compelling reasons for that. And those compelling reasons come from the fact that the university's inquiry process takes place in a certain context, a context which also means, therefore, that the process and its results have extremely far-reaching implications. The context itself doesn't require, I think, most of us here, any significant elaboration. Before the inquiry itself began, there was already a process where against students, extremely serious charges were made and the police filed cases. We had an entire campaign through the media vilifying not only some specific students of this university, but in a sense the entire people, uh, all, all, all sections of JNU and everyone was subjected to this vilification kind of campaign, which was not only about their reputations, but placed many of them at in very degree, varying degrees of risk. We have had situations where our people going out and speaking in different places have been attacked simply because if you have the tag of this being part of this university, you have been subjected to all kinds of targeting. That was the context or the background within which this particular inquiry process into the incidents of 9th February actually began. Precisely, it was a context in which there was obviously, from the entire environment created, there was naturally a pressure on the university to act, quote unquote, decisively, even if that process of acting meant that the normal principles which should apply to any process of investigation of the truth and administering of penalties, that those principles, even if they are violated, no matter what uh, such violation takes place, no matter who pays the price for that, the imperative to act decisively was something that the entire environment was creating. But as a university, it was also precisely at such a time that the basic principles which must always be upheld in any such inquiry into the truth and into any process of administering any penalty, the basic principles that should be applied in such cases in these circumstances were there was an exceptional reason why those principles should have been upheld by the university. Whether the university's process has actually managed to do so, or whether the process itself has fallen victim to that larger environment that was created, is really the point of issue or debate that we are facing. This has been an issue of contention. This has been an issue of debate, okay, because of the fact that as a community in the university, we realized that this process and what it would lead to had a number of serious implications. The implications were not simply the implications that would fall on the specific students who were investigated and who might therefore be penalized as a result of this particular process. Even in their case, the implications as far as this particular case was concerned were much more severe than what might have normally been the case because it was not just a question of a disciplinary action affecting their lives and careers in the way that all disciplinary actions may affect the lives and careers of students, but here it was much more than that. Their life, liberty, and their security, safety, everything was in a sense affected by this particular process. But apart from what it would have implications for the students directly affected, the concern that we have had as teachers is what this process eventually means for the university. It is the threat or the danger to the university and what it is supposed to exist for, which was our central concern. 
we know that the implications of the implications of this process for the autonomy of the university we know the possible and potential implications of this process for defining what can or cannot happen within the university we understand therefore the potential dangers to the atmosphere of free discussion and debate which are not only a characteristic of the university but are necessary part of the uh, keep, keeping the academic processes of this university alive it is those very far reaching implications of this particular process which has made us depart from what is a normal practice teachers of this university very rarely have gone into questions about uh, inquiries and processes against students in the normal course that doesn't happen but this departure has been compelled by very important the the context in which this particular process has un unfolded as i said it's been whether the university's process has fallen victim to this larger context or it has upheld the principles that the university should stand for is has been a matter of contention and debate and there are clearly two different points of view in this event today itself there will be some contention in so far as this event involves bringing the different perspectives uh, into the debate or the, uh, which a part of this debate or discussion in front of this entire uh, audience today okay so that contention is there that conflict is there however we have continuously maintained that conflict or contention is not the end or the objective we are looking for a resolution but a resolution that must uphold the principles that we hold dear that must be founded on the principles we hold dear even today our objective remains one of resolution and not primarily contention it is with that idea that we decided to have this particular event today in which we thought the objectives that we have of examining what hap has actually happened in the last one and a half months in terms of the inquiry process whether it has upheld the principles that should be upheld or not that this is subject to not only an examination by those who are not involved in this university that they are both independent but who also have an appropriate expertise or bring into that process of examination experience and both a theoretical as well as a practical engagement with the fundamental principles which are at stake that was the idea behind having this particular program in which the chosen format is that we will have a set of our colleagues presenting what how they view the process as it has unfolded and what are the reasons why we have had issues with that particular process we also decided to invite the university administration which has been behind that particular process to come and present its own view okay we extended that invitation to the vice chancellor but uh, we are not not so far heard that they are actually going to come and present so we decided that based on what we had discussed re repeated meetings with the administration what we have available in terms of documents that have been circulated publicly by the university based on that we will ask one of our colleagues to make a presentation of what would appear to be the administration's view after that our distinguished panel will share with all of us their reflections on this or examine or talk about what they how they view this particular process with reference to the basic principles that should be upheld in any such inquiry that's the core idea of this particular process whether this event will help us and in what way to find a resolution to the problem here is something that only time will tell but i do hope that at least one of the ways in which it will contribute is that the end of today all of us with the contributions from our distinguished panelists have a much more informed and educated view of the issues that are at stake with that let me try with me introduce our extremely eminent and distinguished panel we have justice ajit prakash shah who uh, needs very little in terms of introduction he is a very is a extremely distinguished and illustrious career in the process of not only administering justice but also in the process of framing and interpreting laws he has been the chief justice of the madras high court 
and also he has been the Chief Justice of the Madras High Court and he now and he retired as the Chief Justice of the Delhi High Court. He has been the author. He has been the author of many celebrated judgments. Uh, of course, we are all familiar with the judgment on the decriminalization of homosexuality, but that's not the only judgment for which Justice Shah is, is celebrated. There are several judgments on the application of the RTI Act, on child labor, on contract labor, on laws relating to women, all of which he has authored and for which uh, he is acknowledged as one of the premier, premier jurists of, of this country. <laughs> he has also been actively engaged in the process of legal reform and formulation of laws. He was the chairman of the 20th uh, Law Commission and while he was chairman, a number of reports were actually submitted to the government. He is a member of uh, many committees and commissions that have gone into different laws from a whole range of laws like direct tax laws to, of course, laws relating to uh, labor. So it's been an extremely distinguished career that we have, and we are extremely privileged that he has agreed to join us today here and to contribute to this extremely important process. Thank you, Dr. Shah, uh, Justice Shah. We also have Dr. Minal Satish, who is a uh, member of the faculty at uh, National Law University, uh, Delhi, who is an uh, expert in criminal law but who, apart from his uh, experience in teaching, including in judicial education, uh, he's also been associated with the National Judicial Academy in Bhopal. Apart from his teaching experience, he's been also actively involved in the process of law reforms in this country. He assisted the Justice Varma Committee and also the uh, Law Commission of which Justice Shah was the uh, chair. And finally, we have Dr. Vari, uh, sorry, I'm so used to saying doctor because of this being a university. <laughs> uh, Varisha Farasat, who is also a practicing lawyer, uh, who is, uh, uh, was earlier associated with the, in the International Institute for Transitional Justice and the Center for Equity Studies, Delhi, who does not want us to say anything more than that about her. So, we are very thankful to Dr. Satish and uh, Varisha Farasas for having been here. Uh, so let us first welcome our distinguished panelists. And uh, I would invite uh, our three members of our faculty first who are going to make the presentation on behalf of the JNUTA. Uh, Professor Rajat Datta from the Center for Historical Studies. Professor G. Arunima. and uh, Dr. Avinash Kumar. <laughs> Professor Sachidanan Sina will have the onerous responsibility of presenting the administration's perspective on the issue. <laughs> but before we begin, before we begin, I'd just like to make one request. This is a serious engagement. This is a serious, there are serious questions that we are examining here. We do not expect from our panelists to, at the end, to give any kind of a verdict or a decision, but to share, based on their own experience and knowledge, based, share with us some perspectives which will help us have a better understanding of the issues involved. Okay. So I would request everyone to ensure that the decorum, that a dispassionate engagement with the issues at stake requires that that decorum be maintained throughout this particular program. Thank you very much. We'll just take a minute to, uh, uh, to connect this to the uh, electricity and then we'll begin the process. Yes. Thank <laughs> you. 
So the first act of this event is the presentation on behalf of the JWTA of why it is felt that this whole process is, uh, what its questions about the whole process are. And this, as I said, will be presented by uh, a team of three members of our faculty. And may I therefore request... <laughs> may I therefore request Professor Rajat Datta to begin the proceedings. Thank you, Jirojit. Uh, let me just uh, <clears throat> say at the beginning that what uh, we are uh, going to say is what I would call the considered opinion of the Januta. An opinion which has been formulated by a number of discussions, a number of GBMs, and a process of introspection uh, amongst all of us on what has happened in this university uh, from the 9th of February 2016. I want to focus on four aspects of uh, this, uh, broadly uh, in order to uh, talk about the process of inquiry, the fairness and the procedural correctness of the process of inquiry. I'm not a law person, I'm a historian but a concerned teacher and therefore part of my uh, being here is out of that concern that I feel very strongly that something fundamentally wrong transpired in the way the aftermath of the events were handled by the JNU administration and this is what I want to talk about. So there are there are three or four there are three or four things that I want to uh, take up. One is a procedural matter. The other is the processual matter. Then comes the question of intimidation and coercion and vilification of the students concerned. The biases which I see which were embedded in the inquiry process, the high level inquiry committee which was constituted on the 11th of February, and finally take a look at why did Januta, the Teachers Association, decide to question the very, uh, well, the legality in a sense, but also the operational part of the high-level inquiry committee, the HLEC. We all know the run-up to the event, so I don't have to go through it. Uh, we, or less, even if, us, even if we don't, uh, we were informed and educated by a number of media channels about how anti-national slogans were shouted in JNU and so on and so forth. And leading to the, the um, lodging of criminal proceedings against a number of students under section 124A, slope 34 IPC. IPC. On 11th February again, uh, the police was asked, police asked for permission to enter campus and was given permission by the regist acting registrar, if I may say, and the letter very clearly says, whatever action they deem fit to take in the campus. And that, we feel, was the first major assault on the autonomy of the university, and I'll come back to that uh, when I conclude. And uh, on the 11th of February, again, the university initiated a formal inquiry process, uh, day after criminal complaints against the organizers had been lodged by people from outside JNU. The FIR that was registered was registered from persons outside JNU and not from within JNU itself. Now this brings me to the procedural part, which is that what kind of systems do we have in place when there is what I make inverted commas called law and order problem within the university. There are internal mechanisms which are embedded in the statutes of the university, which is basically a proctorial committee Proctorial committee, first a fact-finding committee, then a proctorial committee. Proctorial committee, fact-finding committee recommends uh, to the proctorial committee that prima facie there is a case of 
a law and order problem. Then the proctorial committee takes up, launches its own investigation, and then the vice chancellor is informed about the findings of the proctorial committee on the basis of which the vice chancellor then takes a call on the quantum of punishment or whatever that the ultimately the disciplining or, or punishment that has to be meted out has to be done by the vice chancellor and by nobody else. Everybody else can only recommend to the vice chancellor as to what to do. Now on the uh, day, on the, the proctorial committee was set up uh, and initially was sent out notices to students uh, seeking depositions and evidence till the 26th of February. That was the date which the proctorial committee had given for these students to submit the depositions, which was superseded without any public notification as to why this was being done by on the same day as the proctorial committee was set up by a high level inquiry committee on the uh, which was called appointed by the vice chancellor no explanation was offered as why there was this very urgent need to deviate from the standard procedures of inquiry uh, after a problem of, of, of breach of discipline or whatever the st specific terms of reference of this committee were not given to anybody nor were the norms and procedures applicable to its proceedings notified publicly. In any inquiry, I would understand the principle of natural justice would be that there would be a public declaration of the terms and references of the inquiry committee. None of this was done. The high-level inquiry committee was asked to submit its final report by the 25th of February, that's within a week, a deadline which had then had to be subsequently extended twice. Uh, first, the 3rd of March, and finally the 11th of March, 2016. Now, this brings me to the procedural, procedural part, which is basically that the suspension of eight students from academic activities on the 12th February itself. You set up the committee on the 11th of February, and on the 12th of February, the committee finds prima facie evidence to suspend eight students from academic activities, but they are allowed to stay in the hostel in, because the depositions would be required to, uh, uh, for this high-level committee. So between the constitution of the committee and the act of uh, what may be called meeting out justice, there is not even a hearing which has been given to the students who have been suspended on what is called prima facie evidence about their involvement. And for till today, we really do not know what that prima facie evidence was. So it remains a mystery. And the final report of the HLSC, High Level Committee, uh, does not mention even once the name of one of the eight students originally suspended. So what comes out at the end of the day by the high-level inquiry committee does not mention, does not have the, mention the names of the students the high-level committee originally suspended on the 12th of February. And such things mount up. Uh, the member of the HL, HLC admitted to the media they do not have full names of students whom they wish to invite to depose with the committee and have therefore, for instance, had to invite all the 22 Anjali's on campus. So there is one Anjali and there are 22 Anjali's and all of them are asked to depose with the, uh, uh, on a principle, I, pres I presume, of eeny, meeny, mina, mo. Somewhere we'll be able to pinpoint that particular Anjali. We are all familiar with the media trial that was unleashed uh, on the students and on the university itself. And we also know that many of these so-called videos were fabricated. Uh, we earlier used the term doctored, but then we thought it was an insult to all doctors that we had in the university, so we used the term fabricated and morphed. Doctored is a term which is not allowed to be used in, in, the, in, in the campus. Um, that some of the, and also that some of the initial oral evidence attributed to members of the genuine security staff were also false and tutored not doctored. <laughs> now, some of these, the Delhi government appointed its own magisterial inquiry, and that has submitted its report, and some of these were mentioned in the magisterial uh, committee report, which was submitted on the 2nd of March. Now, the problem here is that you have a situation where you have set up a high-level committee, they have suspended students, 
they have debarred them from academic activity, but they really don't know on what charges and without being given a due process at all. Then starts the process of intimidation and coercion. On the 12th of February, the president of the Genusu was picked up and locked up on charges of sedition for two weeks before he was granted bail by the High Court. And all this while, JNE was being pilloried uh, by the media as a bed of anti-national activities and, and much worse. Then uh, the Delhi, then they also, Delhi police then uh, asked for the surrender of two more of our students who were taken into custody on the 25th of February and on released on bail on the 18th of March 2016. Plus there was the shameful incident of beating up of teachers and journalists in Patiala House Court in full public view. So all this was not part of the high level inquiry committee, but the point was that all the, mat, uh, the, the entire world had taken over uh, the process of what had happened inside JNU. Which brings me to the biases that are embedded in what we see is embedded in the high level committee. We see obvious, the obvious bias we see is the hostility to the interests of students. The university administration did not uh, take into account the embedded fairness of its inquiry processes and its adherence to natural justice. These two were completely missing from the way in which the high level inquiry committee was constituted. Students who raised queries about the procedures and asked for various issues to be addressed so that they may be able to appear properly with their community were completely ignored and their queries were not answered at all by the high level inquiry committee. It was in this background that the Januta was constantly raising questions, not once but repeatedly, about the credibility of the inquiry process itself. And it's not that the Januta was raising it in thin air. We took this up with the Vice Chancellor on a number of occasions in meetings which we had with him, marathon meetings which we had with him, where we repeatedly told him, please give us the terms of reference of this high level inquiry committee. And we got no answer from the Vice Chancellor at all. So we began to question the credibility of this committee. We demanded that this committee be broadened, we be more inclusive, we be more representative. We demanded that, uh, that uh, it included uh, 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 um, a woman faculty member. We also demanded that it should also include a faculty member from the SC and ST. But well, finally, the committee did uh, was expanded by two, and uh, there was a woman faculty member. But the other part of our demand that one member should be from the marginalized, excluded communities was not addressed. Uh, so, but again, the terms of reference of this committee were not publicly notified. It is a surprisingly hush hush, mysterious committee which was set up, which has now submitted a report. And on top of that, there was a lot of hue and cry about students being rusticated. For about two, three days, the media went crazy reporting that these students are going to be rusticated. And it so turns out that some sympathizer within the administration had been planting these stories to the media that the students are going to be rusticated till it was retracted by the proctor's office through a statement released by the PRO of Jawaharlal Nehru University that there was no uh, question, there was no, there was no such thing on the anvil about about uh, the rustication of students. So, what this high-level inquiry committee finally ended up doing was creating an atmosphere of fear and uncertainty and less of inquiry, and that's what I want to underline. And that is one reason why, because its terms of references were so opaque and so hidden from us that Januta had no other option but to question the very legality of the high-level inquiry committee. And there was another demand which the Januta constantly made, and the vice chancellor constantly didn't listen to us, was that we wanted the acting registrar of the university to be dismissed for the nefarious role that he had. In, and it is not a secret 
he was he was leaking uh, information to the press, etc. More on that will be discussed by my colleague here. But I want to just conclude my presentation on two two points. One, around that time, a similar or an almost similar incident happened in Jadavpur University, Kolkata, where. Apparently, students took out a uh, took a procession. Took out a, there was a there was some kind of a ruckus there. Some slogans were shouted, etc., etc. And the same demand was raised that anti-national slogans were shouted, like in JNU. But the vice chancellor of Jadavpur University took a position, took a stand that it is my university's autonomy. I will investigate the matter internally. I will not let the police come into the campus. This happened almost within a day or two of the incident in JNU, that vice chancellor stood his ground. This vice chancellor gave up entirely, completely capitulated to whoever he wanted to capitulate to. Now, second point that I want to say is the JNU is a central university. And it has been established by an act of parliament in 1966, which gives JNU autonomy. Autonomy to teach, autonomy to develop courses, autonomy to, you know, have probably meetings like these, whatever. It gives university the autonomy, it gives the university its internal mechanisms to sort out problems and issues concerning faculty, students, culturalists, whatever. Yet, this university, which is a beacon now for all democratic aspirations of this country, was the first one to capitulate and surrender this autonomy which was given to it by this Act of Parliament. And sir, this is one of the biggest insults that has been heaped on this university by this administration in the guise of the high-level inquiry committee and on the basis of what happened, uh, taking advantage of what happened on the 9th of February 2016. Thank you, Rajat. Uh, I think uh, Rajat testified to how the university administration undermined its own internal mechanisms and then it failed to ensure the fairness of the inquiry process and compromised the principles of natural justice. Uh, I will now submit to the esteemed panel how these mechanisms were undermined and compromised in the media, which amounted to the genu itself being subjected to a media trial. Uh, the principle of natural justice also includes the premise that justice must be seen to be done, which has been completely lacking in this case. Uh, the eight pages of the high-level inquiry committee uh, report, which has been made available in the public domain, rely primarily on three major sources of information that it has categorized as evidence. In the, uh, in the document submitted, that is the document number six, uh, if you uh, just have uh, a chance to look at that. Uh, and the three uh, uh, sort of sources of information which has been categorized as evidence are the following. Number one, the complaint letter of the JNUSU Joint Secretary dated February 9, 2016. That is document number seven in the documents list. Number two, the deposition of the then acting registrar dated March 3, 2016, uh, which is included in the HELC report seven, uh, document six, and the testimony of some security personnel and an excerpt of a video which is being claimed to have been authenticated by a forensic examination report, but the report has not been made available to us. Now, all of these evidences which the HELC, HLEC sort of bases its inquiry report on are characterized by inconsistencies which I would like and I would like to point out some of these here. Uh, the said complaint of the JNUC Joint Secretary dated February 9th 2016 that is HLEC report term of reference number one para two page two submitted before the event has the subject line and I would like to you know point to this fact, if the subject line reads, regarding the anti-national activities and anti-constitutional slogan in our campus. Now the question is, how could the said complainant know beforehand that the slogans to be raised during event would be anti-constitutional within court? 
the report in arriving to its conclusion does not assess the implication of this kind of an evidence. The second major evidence of the HLEC report in its report is the deposition of the then acting registrar dated March 3, 2016. Mind you, the custodians of the said deposition can only be the HLEC, which, is headed, which had five members, or the acting registrar himself. However, this deposition was leaked to the press conveniently and was reported in the press on the March 7, 2016. But before I go on to discuss the deposition of the acting registrar, I would like to point out that as per the statute referred by Rajat in his presentation, the office of the registrar had no role any at all if in the, in, in the event being organized by student, particularly of February 9, in the campus. However, if the registrar is invited by the students to come and attend this event, or if he voluntarily accepts to come and attend that event, he is most welcome. But the fact of the matter is that none of the two options were exercised on February 9th. What has happened actually is that the office of the registrar, and particularly the acting registrar, has forced himself into the event in order to be part of, of the process. And his deposition clearly shows this. The deposition of the registrar starts with the about a meeting with JNUSU to discuss the bus route. Uh, this is written in HLEC report, term of reference number one, para two, uh, para three, page two, on February 9. However, this date of meeting has been contested by the JNUSU itself. According to the JNUSU, the meeting happened on the previous day, that is February 8, 2016. This has also been corroborated by the HLEC report in the same paragraph where it notes that as per the CCTV footage and the CCTV camera installed outside registrar's office, it is not possible to verify the individuals who went in and came out of the office. I believe there are a number of other CCTV cameras, but that has not been taken into consideration. It must be noted that the introduction of the CCTV evidence rather than any forms of other forms of evidence of meetings such as the signed minutes is highly unprecedented this actually changes the entire description of the event and the role of the acting registrar in the said event but the hlec makes no attempt to either verify or cross-examine this claim further the acting registrar also deposed that subsequently there was a meeting at 4.15, 15 past 4, in the VC's office, which was attended by the Vice Chancellor, the Registrar, the Dean of Students, and the then Chief Proctor to discuss the event. However, let me remind to this August House that the same day there was also a meeting of the new Vice Chancellor with all the wardens at which the Dean of Students and the then Chief Proctor in the capacity, of, in the capacity as a warden was also present. The meeting got over nearly at 4.10 p.m. at the convention center, after which the VC left, but the DOS, that is the Dean of Students, and the then Chief Proctor remained there for some more time with the wardens, who were willing to vouch for this inconsistency. It has also been learned that the Vice Chancellor, after completing his meeting with the wardens, had gone on to visit the School of Arts and Aesthetics. And Yet again, there are people, there are evidences of suggesting so. Therefore, the claim of the acting registrar that they were meeting in the VC's chamber with all the officials mentioned at 4.15 needs to be further verified. And any rigorous inquiry process would therefore include cross-examining to bring out these inconsistencies. It is important for this house to note the fact that the Genuta from the very beginning had pointed out the irresponsible and unsubstantiated statements made by the acting registrar to the press, which amounted to misrepresentation of facts, amounted to demonstration of bias, prejudging the inquiry process, and creating a hostile environment in which students felt it was unsafe for them to testify. And this further led to the unfortunate media trial of the university itself. Starting the sequence, the most important becomes the first statement by the acting registrar, 
which is included in the university status report circulated uploaded in the website and also submitted to the hrd ministry which says i quote the organizers invited the media to cover the program without permission from the university authorities however unquote however the delhi magistrates report found that it was the jnusu joint secretary the complainant who had invited the media to cover the event without permission from the university subsequently the hlec report rectifies this and makes this correction the report does not get into the implications of all these facts for what actually transpired on the 9th of february and does not fix the responsibility on each individual our colleague here will discuss with greater detail about several other inconsistencies consistencies in the report but i would like to point out certain other misrepresentations of facts by the acting registrar you know being carried out on february 14 in an interview to the press the registrar in reply to a question that what was the basis for university's decision to debar eight students from acting academic activities he said and i quote an inquiry committee i didn't find the names identified the students as raising anti india slogans the students who have been debarred were seen raising slogans in the video and kanhaiya was also seen in the video raising anti national slogan unquote on the same day the acting registrar is also reported to have said in another press interview i quote videos released on february 9 are authenticate unquote the question is if there is indeed a reliable video footage as is claimed by the acting registrar and also by the hlc report terms of reference 1 para 4 page 4 p para 1 why was the same not put in the public domain given the role of morphed videos in circulation in building up the crisis and media trial of jnu and why did not the university condemn or issue a statement when those morphed videos were being aired or being circulated in the social media <coughs> to the best of our knowledge the university has not proceeded any legal or quasi legal proceedings against any such media channels subsequently on february 15 the registrar is reported to have again said action taken against students in the past also referring to some of the students against whom the suspension order were issued now some of the statements which i have quoted above these statements are only suggestive and not exhaustive in nature but what is clear from these examples is that unsubstantiated statements made by the acting registrar repeatedly to the media which includes the leaks of his deposition before the hlc the source of which we still do not know prejudiced the whole environment and acted as a fodder to the media trial happening against the university the latest in the series as rajat quoted was the report recently on march 7 where the source you know the the press quoting a senior university official regarding the quantum of punishment already decided by the hlc now the third and important evidence used by the hlc are the testimonies of some security personnel and an excerpt of the video the depositions of mr op yadav corroborated by mr dp yadav are mentioned in the hlc report as the basis of ascertaining what happened in sabarmati dhaba hlc report terms of reference 1 page 3 para 4 regarding that it is important to notice that the delhi magistrates inquiry report has shown that the testimonies of the security personnel were tutor and lacked credibility read chapter 9 of delhi magistrates report in particular the Magist delhi magistrates report states that mr v p yadav made incorrect statements which were retracted later after cross examination by the delhi magistrate in the presence of hlc members similarly mr op yadav's statement was found to be inconsequential page 23 and 25 of the delhi magistrates report the hlc report takes no cognizance of this and other findings of chapter 9 of the delhi magistrates report regarding the tutored dubious and in some case false testimonies of the security personnel 
The report's description of the event of 9th February 2016 includes many things that the Delhi Magistrate Probe did not find any supporting evidence for in there for in either the available video footage or the testimonies of the witness, which also supposedly from from uh, form the basis of the HLSC's rec recommendations. If there is any additional evidence that has been available to the HLEC, there is certainly no indication of that. And after that, we will have Arunima telling about the several other incons inconsistencies in the report. Thank you. We have a table crisis here. Um, so what I'm going to do, let me just uh, um, tell you right at the outset because there's a lot of detail that Rajat and Avinash have spoken about. I will speak only to the question of procedural lapses uh, the, and the kinds of inconsistencies that there is in the uh, high level inquiry committee report. So there are four, okay, um, there are four kinds of issues at stake here. Um, one uh, has been already uh, raised by Avinash, I will just remind us of that, uh, which is to do with what was said about the event of cancellation of the uh, event on 9th um, February. Now, since so many things hinge around that event and issues around that, uh, the question of how it was cancelled, whether it was cancelled, who cancelled it, and so on and so forth becomes important. And what we find is that there is a major discrepancy between what the Dean of Students says and what the Registrar has actually gone and testified. Uh, and the details of this have been raised by Avinash, so I need not reiterate that. Now, the second is the report itself. Now what we have is just eight pages, and that eight pages is probably a fragment, we imagine, we don't know. Now this eight pages, which is called the report, comes with no recommendations whatsoever, and we will look at what the implications of this is. So we have eight pages uh, detailing the sequences, uh, looking at certain kinds of ways in which uh, you know processes were followed, and certain kinds of observations at the end of it. Um, however, uh, since this has been such an extraordinary and difficult time, everybody expected that there would be some recommendations. It has come with no recommendations. Uh, there are no formal punishments that have been announced, and as uh, Avinash uh, uh, also spoke to this issue, but I think it's worth reiterating, uh, the media has been, and Rajat also I think, um, the media has been rife with information about rustication and so on, and then detractions. So this is also something that we want to bear in mind. The third kind of set of issues that I will look at briefly is the show cause notices themselves and how these have been riddled with discrepancies. And finally, what I want to go through very quickly is the substantive structure and content of this report and how these eight pages seem to have been put together and what the problems are with that and why um, finally after much discussion uh, we in the JNU TA decided that we should actually have um, this uh, public event uh, so that this esteemed panel could share their views on whether our reading of some of these things is correct or not. Um, now regarding the first issue about the Dean of Students, now the Dean of Students uh, is, and as both Rajat and Avinash said, uh, there is an internal mechanism that is available within the university and we expect that that there's a certain degree of correctness and transparency about the manner in which that is actually conducted. Now what is actually uh, quite extraordinary about the manner in which the whole Dean of Students cancellation issue comes up is the idea that he is not on campus, that he is in touch with the uh, Chief Security Officer and so on and so forth. There are all manners of different statements that are issued, that are circulating, that is in the realm of rumour. However, when the registrar actually deposes, he contradicts this completely. He says that the dean of students was available till 5 in the evening. Now, if this is indeed the case, it would have been a very easy thing to have cancelled the event. You know, uh, deans and chairpersons do have these kinds of uh, authority. Why wasn't it done? I mean, if that is the case, there is a question around that. Um, now let's go to the second issue, the question of the procedural lapses and the proctoral system. Now, um, 
Rajat has spoken again at length about the proctoral system. I just want to remind us about some issues in relation to that. The question for us is, and there is actually quite a detailed uh, set of norms called the chief proctor's norms. The, in essence, the question for us is this, which is if there is an internal system available, a proctoral system, which is a statutory body, the proctor's office and so on, and there is actually a set of processes available, why was it superseded? Why didn't the proctoral committee conduct its inquiry? Why was it superseded within 24 hours and why was a high-level inquiry committee uh, put in place? Now, since much has been said about that, I don't want to uh, take up more time repeating those things. The second issue, which is about these eight pages which we now treat as the high-level inquiry committee report. Here we have to speak to this question of the show cause notices directly. Now, if you actually look at the text of these uh, uh, of the report itself, we say we see that it's been issued, but we don't know whose names these have been issued in the show cause notices. Nowhere in these eight pages do we get a sense of that. They do not. The the report in its eight pages does not specify the acts of indiscipline. Right? Nor does it specify what evidence has been utilized for actually charging these students. Now, of course, in this, the most uh, farcical part is, as uh, uh, I think uh, either Rajat or Avinash mentioned, the case of the so-called 22 Anjali's, right? Now, this is a kind of situation which, uh, even though today sitting here it might seem farcical, I think it has created an Im immense amount of anxiety in the campus and among students. And I must say that I was quite shocked uh, when I uh, came into the office the other day to find that there are several more such uh, letters that have come to chairpersons uh, which actually mention just one name. Uh, they do not even give the full name of the student and they expect that all over the university it's meant to be put up by chairpersons in all the notice boards of the university and there are three or four such notices that have come. These notices were issued on the 16th of March as recently as this. So uh, uh, the supposed uh, high level inquiry committee is already over but even despite that these notices are still coming. Again, I think uh, it is worth uh, reiteration, it has been mentioned earlier, but I do think that this is an, it's a very, very serious matter that much of what we have got to know in the first instance, and this is why the JNUTA has been continuously protesting, much of what we have got to know in the first instance is via the media. And then this is uh, refuted after we protest through certain kinds of official announcements. Now, if we actually look at the show cause notices, what is... Uh, there are two elements in this, I think, which are worth mentioning. One is that some of these are completely generic in nature. The other specifically mention certain kinds of clauses, and they actually say that the student concerned is being charged with this or that or the other. The question for us is, uh, on what basis have these uh, charges been made? Because if you actually look at the text of the show cause notices, they only cite the rules of discipline. Right? Uh, and they say that these particular rules have been violated. But they do not specify what kinds of acts were done to violate this. Now, unless and until this is actually made clear, it will be very, very difficult to actually even say whether, you know, the minimum, even the generic kind of show cause notice can actually stand up. Now, the interesting, and I think rather more than interesting, the rather significant issue here is that finally it sort of boils down to only one rule, and this comes from the Chief Proctor's norms. It actually boils down to one rule that has been violated, and if we actually distill this down, it comes to this omnibus rule which says that any other act that the Vice Chancellor or any other competent authority may consider indiscipline. Now, this is such a omnibus rule. Right? And it has such a wide latitude, which basically means that you can actually charge a student with anything. Because anything can come under any other act that the vice chancellor or any other competent authority may consider indiscipline. So what we are saying is that 
there is nothing in terms of the detailing of evidence there is nothing in terms of the detailing of the acts of violation of rules there is nothing there uh, that actually adds up all we are left with is a kind of post facto uh, justification of the utilization of this omnibus rule that omnibus rules availability makes it possible to actually fit everything else into that script and i think that is worth remembering now if we go into uh, further inconsist inconsistencies here the uh, text of these eight pages uh, of the uh, hlec report says that they invited students to depose now what this doesn't also say and we actually have the text of uh, written responses that many students uh, had sent in it fails to acknowledge that many students had given written responses saying they were afraid they said that already three students had been arrested eight had been suspended uh, and they were afraid to actually depose in front of such a high level uh, inquiry committee unless and until it was completely transparent what the terms of reference was how this was going to be conducted whether cross examination was going to be allowed and so on and so forth and as we have been continuously sort of pressing the point the principles of natural justice work in all of this being flouted now what is significant here is that once the eight pages get written up it does not acknowledge the fact that students had written in saying that they are afraid of deposing it needed to factor that in it needed to actually take on account why the students were not ready in the current circumstances without transparent sets of terms of reference to come forward and actually depose in whichever manner now again in this and i i you know we discussed this a lot and we chose to call this a fragment because we are not even sure whether this is the entire report or not this is what is actually available for us it does not give if you look at the text of the report it does not give the details of anything of course neither the written responses it doesn't also tell us how students who had been questioned had actually answered now forget the text of all of this it does not even give, give us the list of the people who have actually deposed so in principle the high level inquiry committee report has no detail whatsoever it doesn't give you list it doesn't give you what people have said if they have said anything and it doesn't give you the text of students saying that they are afraid and they do not wish to uh, respond we are told there is one section which speaks about uh, video and other kinds of documentary evidence and so on and so forth it gives you no detail of that either so in essence the high level inquiry committee report which we were all waiting for anxiously gives you no evidence whatsoever it is just a text which gives you some bare bones of certain issues and it is somehow organized around that omnibus rule of the vice chancellor or a competent authority having the latitude to actually define certain kinds of acts as acts of indiscipline so as far as we are concerned then the high level inquiry committee uh, report lacks credibility and let me uh, sort of give you some kinds of details of why we think this is the case one its failure to verify and examine evidence in an impartial way failure to take on both the apprehensions and questions put to the hlc in writing in response to the notices no clear statement on what each student indicted in the report is charged with along with the statement of evidence on the basis of which such conclusions of guilt have been arrived at not putting out the entire body of evidence including video evidence the high level inquiry committee claims to have with the report in a transparent manner reliance on a few persons deposition to build the grounds to fix guilt without any provision of cross verification and cross examination suspending and issuing show cause notices to students who are not even mentioned once in their report so just to finally sum up the kinds of main issues here one the high level inquiry committee report has no recommendations the second is that even though formal uh, announcements of punishments have not been made though all the media leaks retractions and so on and so forth and all of that there is a way in which there is a substantial sense in the university the students are standing condemned 
that some were condemned right at the outset because they were arrested, they were uh, served with show cause notices, they were suspended from academic activities, and at the end of this report, more have been condemned. So there is a way by which without even announcing punishment, you have condemned students. And I think there is something about that, that this is utterly reprehensible. And what is more important is that there is nothing in the report that shows us the process through which this, this kind of uh, um, final kind of conclusion has been arrived at. So I just want to end this and I think um, uh, you know my colleagues here and the JNUT generally is in agreement with the fact that in the current circumstances, the present situation is extremely grave for our university and for our students. This kind of a high-level inquiry committee and its report is extremely alarming because it's not only the question of the immediate kind of impact that it has on the lives and academic prospects and academic futures of the students concerned, but it has very far-reaching consequences for the kind of precedent this can set for universities in the manner in which such serious issues are dealt with. Thank you very much. Well, I have to perform this so-called distinguished job today, and certainly it's not my view at all. Uh, but you know, all through I've been a good actor, so I'd like to enact the role of the JNU administration and sincerely put forward the views. Uh, and defend it if it's if it needed to be. <laughs> anyway, uh, uh, the first is uh, you know the, whatever the university did draws upon uh, the uh, often made reference to the statute uh, uh, which has been and the acts and the statutes which has been passed by the uh, Parliament of India, and uh, uh, the first is, uh, is the statute of the university uh, whose clause 1 and 2 says as follows and it is uh, all that the university acted upon should be seen in that light all parts relating to discipline and disciplinary action in relation to students shall vest in the vice chancellor the vice chancellor may delegate all or such of his powers as he slash she deems proper to the chief proctor and to such other persons as he she may specify uh, in in this behalf thus the vice chancellor was perfectly within his rights to appoint a high level inquiry committee should he deem should he deem the circumstances to be demanding it further the chief proctor office has not been bypassed, as it was reported here. Orders have been issued by the office, including the suspension and so-called notices. The second is the gravity of the incident that took place on the 9th of February, as stated in the university note dated 26 February 2016. On 12th February itself, the Vice Chancellor had issued a notice in which he stated the following. While the JNU community upholds the right to free debate on campus, the university strongly condemns the use of the university as a platform for activities that violate the constitution and the laws of the land. The grave circumstances were also indicated by the case registered by the police and their request for permission to enter the campus, which the administration in its view and based on the legal opinion had no legal right to deny. They state, as stated in the university note of 26th February 2016, it states, considering the serious nature of the alleged offense, permission was given to the police to investigate the matter as per the law of the land. It may be noted that the actions of the Vice Chancellor and his team in response to the situation were also endorsed by endorsed and supported by the Chancellor when he visited the university on the 13th February 2016. In other words, the decision to appoint the HLEC and setting a deadline 
for the submission of its report was an exercise of powers vested in the Vice Chancellor and the need to respond appropriately, keeping in mind the image of the University. Once HLEC was constituted, the approach of the administration has been to trust its judgment and not interfere in any way with its proceedings. It is based on this that the decision was taken to implement without question their recommendation for academic suspension of eight students. It is presumed that the prior FSE evidence used by the committee were, were the chief security officer's report, other documentary evidences readily available with the university and the video footage recorded by the security staff. However, in the interest of probity, the administration eventually also decided that all video footage available with it be submitted to forensic examination and this was made known to the teachers in a meeting. The administration for the same reason left it to the HLEC to recognize its, to organize its proceedings and urged everyone concerned to cooperate with the process. There was no reason for the students to stay away from it and the administration tried its best to persuade them to cooperate despite the fact that it felt that all, sec all its actions thus far were justified, the administration responded positively to the requests from the teachers and broadened the HLEC by including two new members, thus, you know, became making it more early, you know, from the three murti to Panch Parmeshwar. The terms of reference of the committee were, of course, this was not there in the <laughs> Well, you know, it was getting boring for me. <laughs> the terms of reference of the committee were also made clear uh, to it, as can be seen in can be seen from the mention of these terms of reference in the final report. However, on the question of revocation and of the suspensions, as well as the issue of uh, starting the inquiry afresh. Following the addition of two members, the administration, as before, adopted the approach of leaving it to the committee rather than giving it any directives. No recommendation for revocation of suspensions was received from the committee and therefore the administration was not in a position to take any such action. The committee, however, did ask for more time to complete its proceedings and this was accepted by the administration so that the final report was received only on 11th March 2016. Once the, fi once the final findings of the HLEC were received,